Blue stool number 40, Bob Mayer. Is the medium still the message? All right. So Marshall McLuhan, a long time ago in the 60s, wrote a book called Understanding Media, which promptly was misunderstood by virtually everybody who came afterward. If you've ever seen the movie Woody Allen's um, Annie Hall, uh, there's a great scene when they're waiting for a movie and some blowhard professor <clears throat> um, is um, holding forth upon his interpretation of Marshall McLuhan's ideas and Woody Allen's getting progressively more irritated until he finally pulls Marshall McLuhan himself out from behind a sandwich board to tell this guy that he was full of crap. <clears throat> um, it was kind of funny and I hope Marshall McLuhan's not around here because I'm going to say a few things that may or may not be actually canon, but McLuhan's <clears throat> study was on media, right? Um, at the time, the apex of media was television, really. So and it, the core of his thesis it gets fairly complicated, but the core of it is, in that phrase, the medium is the message, right? Uh, the fact that the product or the, the um, content of any medium is another medium. Uh, radio carries the medium of music, right? Or song or voice or whatever. Um, books carry the medium of literacy, of words. And he had a bunch of things about hot and cold media and stuff, but the essence of what he was talking about was that the way we receive information or data, content, is as important, if not more so, than what we are actually receiving or getting. <clears throat> and he goes through the document this, still looking at things as wide-ranging as roads and paper to phonographs and things like that. I'm interested in the contemporary era and particularly in the digital world, the virtual space, the internet. And I'm particularly interested in music because I use music in class <clears throat> a lot. And one of the things I've noticed when I'm doing music as text uh, for a variety of purposes to ana analyze is that there's a disconnect between the way I am looking at music and the way oftentimes my students are looking at music. <clears throat> and I was pondering this as many reasons why. And I've talked with other folks, like my office mate there, Craig, and others on these things, and a lot of different opinions. But <clears throat> to me, it seems that a lot of this is tied up in actually the medium that people get music through today, which is primarily the internet. Now, McLuhan died in the 80s, I think, in mid-80s, long before the internet became a big thing. But a lot of his ideas sort of lay the groundwork for an, an interpretation of what he might have said had he gotten to appreciate the internet. Um, and I think there's some interesting things I can dig out of there. <clears throat> As a medium, the internet is sort of like the uber medium or the er medium, right? If every medium carries just another medium, the internet carries every other medium, right? But it's more than just that, right? If you get a, a, a record back in the old days of physical things or a CD or a tape, um, you got a thing, right? Um, but it was sort of discreet. If you watch television or listen to the radio, you got representations of things and your ability to manipulate them was somewhat limited. With the internet, you get the things themselves oftentimes because we've managed to translate the paradigm or transform the paradigm from the physical to the virtual. So the thing itself is digitized, right? So the song is a collection of bits and bytes or the video is a collection of bits and bytes. That is the actual thing that you can then take and retransmit or reproduce in many ways. And the technology is important because it is so easy to do so and it's with pretty much 100% fidelity, which is something that was not possible with earlier mechanical technologies in which there's a certain degree of difficulty as well as loss involved in any sort of duplication or dissemination. The internet has given us the technology to seamlessly and instantly duplicate and transmit anywhere the actual things themselves. And if you're coming from a paradigm like I am of an older generation of looking at media as things that were embodied in physical items, whether LPs or later on tapes or DVDs or whatever, <clears throat> your view of, this, of the media itself, of the content, is going to be different than if you're coming of age when the media itself is not real or not physical, but is in a sense digital and imminently sort of both fungible and permeable and disseminatable and, and reproducible. <clears throat> so looking at it this way, I'm thinking, okay, the internet also, as a medium, doesn't just give us the ability, like television, to see something or radio to hear something. It gives us the ability to do something because some of the things you get through the are actual applications, actual ways of manipulating and transforming other things. 
Now, television can give us ideas, radio can give us ideas, but the internet can give us the actual mechanical, you know, digital, virtual sense, things that will do, you get apps, right? You can do things that then act on other things. <clears throat> right. So within that context, what we would consider media content, things like music, movies, that sort of stuff, exist within a very different universe, right? They're part and parcel of stuff that is, we regard as sort of instantly accessible, instantly duplicatable, but also sort of existing in and of itself, right? There is no necessary, we are disconnected from the, the creation of it, we're disconnected even to the monetization of it. And this is another thing that McLuhan doesn't really go into, <clears throat> but traditionally with most media, the monetization of that media is very transparent. It's right there. You understand it. Mm -hmm. You buy a record. You buy a CD. You buy a DVD. You buy sheet music. You know, <clears throat> you may you have to buy, of course, the phonograph or the device to do it. But the actual stuff, you had to physically obtain. If you stole it, you physically had to get it. And if you got it bootlegged, it came to you in a physical format. There was a transaction cost involved, right? And that transaction was more than just monetary in the sense that commodification structured the way you viewed that stuff. Um, the limits of your, you know, sort of acquisition of this sort of thing were physical, whether they're monetary or space or whatever. Um, I remember people who would acquire many, many record albums and things. It was a big deal. It cost a lot of money, took a lot of space, right? The same amount of music that somebody who was an avid audiophile in the 1970s could have in like their dorm room would be a tiny fraction of what is available on somebody's phone, right? I'm thinking that this makes a difference, that technology at certain points in time causes a sort of a paradigm shift in the way we view things. In many cases, te technology just sort of iterates and evolves with things, but I think we've built a fundamental transition here in the way we view these things and the way we process them intellectually <clears throat> as well as sort of uh, economically. So all of this sort of is in service of this idea of, okay, why is it that when people, not me, and not my generation, my students, look at the songs, the media that I give them as text, why are they seeing them differently? And so I have some hypothesis. <clears throat> that in a sense, the message of the internet medium is one of vast expanse. It's one of instantaneous access. It's one of deratinated or unrooted lack of connection. It's alienation in Marxist terms. The stuff is there, it exists, it is easily accessible, it's instantly accessible, it's instantly duplicatable. It has no particular grounding in anything. And this is, in, you know, people, not to make not moral judgments, not good or bad, it's just that when one wants to access this media, the only real limits are, in a sense, bandwidth. I mean, the only reason that high quality video isn't quite as easily available as music is that doing things like 4K over modern broadband is kind of problematic right now, especially in this country. <clears throat> but people are viewing, my argument would be, that people are viewing this media in a way that's fundamentally different than I am. And so when I look at it, I'm looking at it as rooted in a time and a place, in a context. And this context was sort of solidified by the fact that it was available in a physical form that had to be purchased, that had to be transported, that had information on it, usually encoded on the, you know, pictures or in words, and that was easily associated with the people that created it, whose names and such were on it, but also in when you got it and what was going on around it. It's sort of an artifact that carried with it its own context. Whereas the exact same piece of music, for instance, taken off the internet, has none of that. And when I have them view a Led Zeppelin song, a video of it, or watch it, or listen to it, and go through the lyrics, I'm putting myself back into the 1970s, and I'm thinking of the context, and I'm thinking of what was going on, and I'm thinking of all of the things that were wrapped up in that, because to me, those are all still embodied in it. Because when we were buying those mu that music or acquiring it back then, <clears throat> we were doing it within that context. They are not. It is one of n to the nth power of things that are associated only by whatever search terms are being used, that is being downloaded and it is ephemeral. It will be listened to or and disposed of, it is gone. It may be interesting, it may be good, it may be fine, but to then say, okay, view this as culturally significant, view this as important, view this as something we need to talk about, becomes very difficult because the framework is simply not there. The same ha phenomenon is happening in uh, copyright intellectual property law, where the transition from 
laws that were built upon physical media and the actual difficulties of duplication and dissemination are now being applied to a situation where it's completely the opposite. Ascribing ownership and monetizing things is done differently. The internet is, indirect, is oftentimes indirectly monetized. Yes, you can buy things from Google Play or Apple, the Apple Store, but most of it's indirectly monetized through the ISPs, <clears throat> through the advertising, through the big data. The older model of media was directly monetized, in which you bought things individually, which ascribes value to them, but also contextualizes them in a way that it is not. Indirect commodification leads to sort of an indirect identification with the media itself. So in short, I would have to say that one of the way I've been thinking about this is that, yeah, the medium is in effect still the message. That the message of the internet, though, is a fundamentally different one than McLuhan was actually grappling with. And in one way, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I think it's fundamentally different than what a lot of us who did not grow up with that are grappling with too, in that information, data, content, media, in terms of what we access and see, the content itself, is determined now, sort of the value and, it's, and our understanding of it is determined by how we're getting it. And that has far-reaching ramifications I think we're just now sort of beginning to explore, which just, in my terms, just makes it more difficult for me to get students to do the work. But <clears throat> that's pretty much my thoughts on that. So there you have it. <clears throat>